Thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar from Chelsea Green Publishing. Uh, today, we're happy to have Dr. Stephanie Seneff, the author of the new book, Toxic Legacy, which I will show here, obligatory visual, visual aid, um, along with Bridget Gustafson, who is the co-founder of Herbicide Free Cal and the director of student fellowships at Herbicide Free Campus, which is kind of co-sponsoring this event with us today. A couple of quick announcements before I just turn it over to the panelists. Um, the first thing is that this webinar is being recorded. You may have noticed that, and it will be available on the Chelsea Green YouTube channel probably sometime early next week. And anyone who is attending and who is registered will receive an emailed link to the recording, so you will be able to find it, share it, what as you like. Um, this this. Webinar is going to last about an hour, shouldn't be more than that. We're going to try to wrap things up around the top of the hour. We do want to make sure to make time and make space for people to contribute questions. So I would encourage you to feel free to, to post questions during the course of the conversation. And we may not get to them until later in the conversation, but we will try to get to as many, hopefully all of the questions that are posted. If you want to post a question, I would ask that you do it in the Q&A uh, section. There's a little Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen that you should see rather than in the chat. That makes it easier for us to find the questions. There may be material that we'll want to post in the chat or that people want to post to share among themselves, and that's fine to use the chat. But the pr predominant place that I'm going to be looking for questions is in that Q&A area on the screen. So if you put your questions there, they will be found. Um, I do want to point out in the chat, speaking of the chat right now, there is a link in the chat to uh, the page on the book or the books page on our website at chelseagreen.com where you currently receive a 35% discount uh, if, you, if you buy it from chelseagreen.com directly. I put a discount code in there, but then I was notified that you don't actually need the discount code. I think everything is... Um, everything is, it's marked down at 35% off already. So you don't need the code to this, to, uh, at checkout. Someone is saying they don't see the link. It should be right at the top of the chat. Uh, and Sean, I think is maybe posting that again in case for some reason mine was not visible. Um, just a quick word about, about Stephanie's book. So this, this is kind of the subject of the conversation today, Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Killer Glyphosate is Destroying Our Health and the Environment. Um, it was referenced by the number one New York Times bestselling author of Grain Brain, Dr. David Perlmutter, who called it unquestionably one of the most important books of our time. We just got a review in the Boston Globe that, that described it as urgent and eye-opening, a loud and clear alarm. And Kirkus Reviews, an independent review, uh, described it as a game changer that we would be foolish to ignore. So that's, you know, it's a book. It just came out a couple of months ago. We're very happy to have it. We're, and we're very happy to have both uh, Bridget and Stephanie joining us today. So quick introductions. Uh, Bridget Gustafson is, as I mentioned, the co-founder of Herbicide Free Cal and the director of student fellowships at Herbicide Free Campus. And I think a co-founder of Herbicide Free Campus, perhaps too. Um, graduate of the University of Cal at Berkeley, where when she wasn't competing on their division one beach volleyball team, mm -hmm. the obligatory Olympics, uh, Olympics tie in there was <laughs> she was studying molecular environmental biology, forestry and natural resource management and human rights. In addition to her work with herbicide free campus, Bridget is the garden and nutrition coordinator at the Ben Johnson Educational Center, a workforce development program serving youth that face systemic barriers to employment in Natchitoches, Louisiana, uh, which is a word that's more difficult to spell than it is to pronounce. <laughs> so thank you for being here, Bridget. We're really happy to have you. Um, and Stephanie Seneff is a senior research scientist at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Stephanie has a bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in food and nutrition and a master's degree, engineer's degree, and a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science, all from MIT. Since 2010, the focus of Dr. Seneff's research has been the effects of drugs, toxic chemicals, and diet on human health and disease. And she's authored over three dozen peer reviewed journal papers on topics relating human disease to nutritional deficiencies and toxic exposures, focusing most specifically and most relevantly to what we'll be talking about today on the herbicide glyphosate and as well as the mineral sulfur. 
And Dr. Senef is joining us today from Hawaii. She splits time mm -hmm. between Kauai, the island of Kauai and Massachusetts. So thank you both for being here and I'm gonna disappear and turn this over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here with all of you today um, and especially you, Stephanie. I'm so excited to get uh, a chance to talk with you. Um, and for those of you who like me might've been a little bit intimidated hearing all of the degrees that Stephanie has <laughs> behind her name um, this book is, is really, really, truly accessible um, when it comes to the language and the way that you, you know, explain and really thoughtfully articulate um, a lot of the, the perhaps more difficult science. Um, and so for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to read it, um, I thought it might be helpful to start with sort of a roadmap of Stephanie, what, what you did. Um, in terms of this book, and maybe that can also provide fruit for some questions um, that the audience members might have. So um, Stephanie began with um, a history of glyphosate and its impact on the ecosystems and wildlife, um, and then began to talk about how glyphosate damages the gut microbiome. Um, she showed how it substitutes for the amino acid glycine during protein synthesis. Um, and then how glyphosate's unique mechanism of toxicity affects specific conditions in the human body. So for example, liver disease, um, you know, reproductive health, neurological disorders, and autoimmunity. Um, and finally, she ends with a call to action of how, you know, we as individuals can um, reduce not only our, or reduce our exposure and our family, friends, and neighbor's exposure to this chemical until it, you know, it's banned, um, which is ultimately the goal. And so let's just allow that to lay the foundation for um, where we go. But where I wanted to begin um, is Stephanie, you write that the goal of this book is to convince anyone who eats, anyone who has children, and anyone who cares about the health of humans and the planet that we need to look much more closely and much more carefully at the impact of glyphosate on and beyond the food supply. And so, you know, throughout the book, you talk about how we've been failed by regulatory establishments and the scientific community. Um, and you show this through a number of peer reviewed studies and connections you've drawn to the biological and chemical processes. Um, I'd love to draw you into this conversation by maybe starting with the timeline of glyphosate's discovery to really set us up for um, you know, all that to come, having it start being discovered as a, is it chelating agent? Elating agent, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, it's quite interesting because originally it was not targeted as an herbicide. It was, uh, it was very good, at, it is very good at binding to metals and that's part of its toxicity in our bodies and also in the plants. Uh, it disrupts the uptake of minerals, for example, and you get mineral deficiencies. Um, but it was uh, patented as a chelator to help clean clean pipes, basically, initially. And that was in 1961, and it was not Monsanto. It was a Schaefer company or something. It was a chemical, co a company that somebody different from Monsanto. Monsanto, I think it was Monsanto uh, researchers who discovered just by accident that it could kill plants. And in fact, it kills all plants except for those that are engineered to resist it. And that should give you some hint to its toxicity because many of these herbicides are, are specialized in only certain species but glyphosate is a universal killer of all plants. Uh, the ones that have been engineered to resist it, they've, they've been augmented with a bacterial gene and that's the GMO technology. So it was patented, it was um, approved for use by about 1974. That was when it first came uh, into the marketplace, I think both for residential and for uh, applications in agriculture. And it wasn't used so much between 1974 and kind of the end of the century because um, you, you kill the plant as well as the weed. So you have to be very careful with it. But when they discovered this whole concept of GMO engineering and they were able to find this bacterial gene that was insensitive to glyphosate, it was a critical protein in the plants that gets disrupted, which is called EPSP synthase. And it's in a critical pathway for the plants called the shikimate pathway. 
And the argument that's used to say that we're immune to glyphosate is that our cells don't have that enzyme. They don't have that even, they don't even have that pathway so that we're not susceptible to it. And that's a nice argument. It sounds very appealing. A big problem is that our microbes have the pathway, have the enzyme and they get clobbered by glyphosate when they're exposed. And we're getting exposed through our food supply and it's killing our beneficial mi microbes and causing disruption of the gut. So um, about the end of the uh, 1990s was when they rolled out these GMO Roundup Ready crops. There was corn, soy, canola, uh, sugar beets, um, alfalfa, and cotton. Those are the main uh, crops that have this magic gene that protects them from glyphosate. And it was a real boon for agriculture. Initially, they were getting you know, significant increases in yield and a cheaper way to grow food, very excited about it. But the, the, the honeymoon got over pretty quickly because they started to see that the, uh, the weeds could become resistant. Just through the exposure, the weeds would evolve to be resistant to glyphosate. So they had to use higher and higher amounts of glyphosate year by year. The soil started getting messed up too because the soil bacteria were getting clobbered by the glyphosate. Minerals were, were not being taken up by the plants. The plants got sicker, they got more susceptible to drought, more susceptible to fungus infection. These kinds of problems started appearing in greater numbers. So, you know, it, it really, uh, at some point, I think it became a situation where the cost benefit analysis is not clear, but because they were so used to doing it, they just kept doing it. They didn't know what else to do, they just do more. So they just kept adding more and more glyphosate to the, to the crops and more and more glyphosate accumulated in the foods. The Monsanto would report to the regulators, oh gosh, we're exceeding the limits, you need to raise the limits, and they would do so obediently, just, okay, we have to multiply by a factor of 10 on this, on this particular food because we're seeing levels. Uh, in the food that are much higher than our limit, we don't want that, you know, them to, to, to uh, break the law. So what we'll do is just raise the limits. And that just happened recently in Canada. They raised the limits on several uh, foods because, you know, basically Monsanto said, oh, you need to raise these limits or else we're going to be, you know, you're going to be selling illegal food. It's frustrating that they don't even bother to test whether the glyphosate is safe or not at any level. They just, you know, routinely just uh, oblige and allow the food to get more and more toxic over time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to I want to kind of hone in on something that you you said early in your description, and that was about the gut microbiome and this um, argument that's often used. And I think that we what we've faced um, in herbicide free campus and our organizing there has been this exact argument of uh, humans don't have this particular pathway that glyphosate affects, right? Um, and just to give all the audience members context, one of our advisors, Dwayne Lee Johnson, who was a groundskeeper um, who tragically developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, from exposure to Roundup, so to this herbicide that Stephanie's talking about that has glyphosate in it, um, he was told it's safe enough to drink, mm -hmm. that this, this herbicide was safe enough to drink. And um, I think, you know, what, what we don't understand or what's not made public knowledge is that in our gut, all the microorganisms, all of those have this pathway that glyphosate does affect. And so it's just this, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's very destructive to our bodies and um, to our own microbiome as well as the microbiome that exists in the soil. Um, and I just, you know, just to hone in on that. And um, also, you know, Stephanie, that brings up, um, so people who don't eat or who try to stay away from GMO food, um, I think a really, really important thing that you write about is how some of the highest levels of glyphosate have actually been consistently found in non-GMO foods, most specifically those derived from wheat oats and legumes. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can tell us how that is. Right, yes, that's an important point. And that was one that was kind of a shocker for me too. When I noticed the gluten intolerance problem going, uh, becoming more and more prevalent. And of course I was already aware of glyphosate. I, I really, I got the idea, oh, maybe glyphosate is causing that. And that's when I found out actually that it was being used as a desiccant on the wheat right before harvest. And it was like, oh my God, of course, that's why. And I really believe that the gluten intolerance problem, which is an epidemic today, is caused primarily by glyphosate. 
uh, getting into the wheat. And uh, so wheat, oats, and you mentioned all of those legumes, uh, and I think some of the uh, seed crops as well are being sprayed right before harvest as a desiccant. The intent is to kill the crops. So these crops are not resistant, they're not, they're not GMO, but they're being sprayed right before harvest to synchronize, often to synchronize the seed so that you'll get an increased yield sometimes to chase the frost because in Canada, you know, it gets cold uh, early. And so you might lose the crop to frost. And so you can actually get it to go to seed prematurely and uh, rescue the crop. But of course, what happens is that a lot of the glyphosate ends up in the foods that are derived from those crops. And Canada has tested over 8,000 different samples, food samples for glyphosate and found really consistently the highest levels in the legumes. They were really incredibly high. And this is like hummus, which feels like a really healthy food but it can be really loaded up with glyphosate. So you really have to watch out to look for the label certified organic. Non-GMO is not enough to assure your safety from glyphosate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when you say it's used as a desiccant, can you describe you know, that, that process maybe a little bit? Right, it dries out the crop. It actually kills it, of course. So it causes it to become uh, drier. And it actually, uh, when, a, when the crop is stressed like that, there's a tendency for the plant to go to seed in response to stress. And often you'll have a crop that only some of it's going to seed, the rest of it's maybe a little bit behind. So you don't get as much of a yield. You have to harvest it at some one point in time. And it may be premature for parts of the crop or too late for some other parts of the crop, whereas you can kind of force all the crop to become ready for harvest at the same time, synchronizing the harvest, drying it out, making it easier to clear the rubble too after you're done. And also getting a head start on next year's weeds you're killing off the weeds as well as the crop at that point. So you're starting to start looking to the next season. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, I know it's just so shocking that these non quote unquote non GMO foods, um, you know, are still being, still being treated with glyphosate and especially that, right before harvest. I'm, I'm actually so shocked that they can't think that might be a problem right before harvest, you know? Right. You can assume it's not going to have time to disappear before it ends up in the food. Mm -hmm. And I know that you mentioned um, soy. I think you, you focus specifically on this, one of the major producers of soy, which is in Argentina, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where some of the highest levels have been found too. Um, right. Yes. And in Brazil, I think there was a study in Brazil that showed that every year there's more glyphosate in the soil. So it's been accumulating year by year, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because it, we were assured that it would break down and disappear quite quickly in the soil. And that's turning out not to be true in many cases. And in fact, it was just a study that came out of Canada. This is since I published my book. They, they found glyphosate in trees that had been treated 12 years before that. So it's still present 12 years later in the trees. Mm -hmm. It gets into the tissues, it, it accumulates in the body, and it causes damage everywhere it goes. Mm. Yeah, because so the way that Mackenzie and I kind of came to this issue and the, the way that we developed Herbicide Free Campus, this campaign that we began was, you know, one day we showed up at beach volleyball practice and our coaches said, hey, like, if you guys hit a ball in this area, don't go get it just for 24 hours, they just sprayed some mm. chemical. Um, it'll be, you know, it'll be gone in 24 hours and then we don't have to worry about it. Wow. And Mackenzie growing up in Hawaii and myself growing up in Illinois, um, both very, very, very familiar with monoculture and, you know, herbicides, because that is the type of agriculture production that, um, is in those two places. We, we both kind of were like, you know, that, that doesn't sound right. Um, but it, again, it was that argument that glyphosate is going to break down within, you know, 24 hours of time or whatever the timeline may be. Um, but your book shows many, many different studies where the way that we thought it broke down in waterways, the way we thought it broke down in the soil, in um, animal organisms, like, that's just not <laughs> that. What we've been told is not is not reality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, one of the studies that I found was really fascinating to me because they showed that when you put glyphosate into water, waterways that have a lot of biofilms from various vegetative growth, the glyphosate actually goes quickly into the biofilms and it ends up with concentrations 100 times as high in the biofilm as it is in the water. So it looks like it's disappearing, but it isn't. It's just going into the biofilms. And I think this is contributing to the manatee crisis in, in southern Florida, they've got a tremendous problem with the manatees. They're dying in record numbers this year. 
They're using lots of glyphosate on the sugar cane fields. They're using it on the beautiful yards, you know, the manicured yards and the waterways. They're using it actually to control the water weeds in the waterway. The glyphosate's all over the place in California. And they've got this big problem with cyanobacteria, blue green, you know, the blue green algae mm -hmm. and the red tide and all these problems that they're facing down there in Florida with the manatees dying and the dolphins are getting uh, Alzheimer's disease. I wrote about that in my book. All mm -hmm. of this is happening in Florida. And I think it, the glyphosate is a major player in that whole mess. And Stephanie, sorry, I'm un what's, what's a biofilm or where would that be found in the water? Yeah, biofilms are, are basically these uh, complex um, networks of uh, microbes, actually, that kind of build this biofilm that builds this kind of protective nest type of um, biomass. It's just biomass connected to microbes, really. Mm -hmm. That It's just sort of the growth. You see all the kind of mud and gunk and the different vegetation that's growing in the, in the waterways is that there would be biofilms okay. in that okay it goes into the vegetative areas of the of the water mm, right. which is what the manatees eat so the manatees get a much higher concentration that way mm, okay ah. um and i guess that that um timeline or the kind of mis mis misconstrued timeline seems to be a, a standard um, of the producers of glyphosate and of Roundup. And in your book, you cited a study um, that came out of France, I believe, um, that pushed back against the industry standard where I think Monsanto um, buyer says that a standard timeline of three months is sufficient time to demonstrate toxicity when you're doing experiments with um, rodents or with you know other any of the other organisms that they would test glyphosate on to try to show its toxicity. Um, and this French study that you cited, they fed mice or was it rats? Rats. Rat. Yeah. Um, round. I get up. them mixed up too. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you fed, or they fed them Roundup treated uh, genetically modified corn to kind of show how chronic exposure to low doses of Roundup can lead to significant harm. Significant harm. Um, and, you know, the study was discredited due to its sample size, but it's important to note that the, um, the folks who discredited the uh, study said that the results that presented were not incorrect. They were simply inconclusive due to the sample size. And I'm wondering if um, maybe how this study differs from the trials that Monsanto has done. And if that same experiment of looking at chronic exposure to low um, doses of glyphosate that you know mirror how humans consume glyphosate um, has that been repeated in a larger sample size since that study? Well, I should say, first of all, that the Monsanto studies that were done uh, were similar to sample size. So it wasn't like they had done something different from what had been done in the Monsanto studies. It was also a small sample size. And they had this rule you could quit at three months. And, and this was Sarah Lini was the French uh, lead on that, on that paper. That was, a, that was a very important paper to me. It, I learned about glyphosate in September 2012. And I and then I started researching and that paper was one of the first things I came across. And that's what convinced me to keep on looking. It was a breakthrough paper because they showed that low doses of glyphosate are toxic if you wait long enough and that glyphosate is a slow kill. And that's the trick that they get by with by just stopping at three months. By three months, the exposed rats didn't really look at any noticeably different from the unexposed rats. It was at four months that they started to see problems. By the end of the experiment, they had the, the females had massive mammary tumors. The males had uh, kidney problems, liver problems, both genders had uh, reprodu reproductive issues and they had a shortened lifespan. So there were major problems that occurred, but it took time. And that is a really big problem with glyphosate that it doesn't bowl you over. So when you get exposed, if you get sp exposed to small amounts, you don't realize you're being poisoned because it's subtle, but mm -hmm. because it accumulates in your tissues and messes up your proteins, eventually you start to see symptoms of strange diseases that you don't understand. You know, you're just feeling sick in ways that you don't understand what's wrong and nobody can figure it out because of that subtle connection. Um, what that study did was it inspired people to start looking at low dose glyphosate in all kinds of other experiments. Because mm -hmm. before that they were always using high doses and they had this idea that 
if it's a high dose, if the high dose isn't, doesn't appear to be toxic, you don't need to look at, at any lower doses. And mm -hmm. that was the trick they used to avoid uh, identifying glyphosate as an endocrine disruptor because endocrine disruptors have that weird property that they're more toxic at low doses than they are at high doses. And once that people realized because of this paper by Sarah Lini, and by the way, it did get republished. It got retracted under pressure from the industry for grounds that were not legitimate. And then it got republished by another uh, reputable journal. So it still stands in the literature, literature yeah. as, a, as, a, <clears throat> as a reference. And um, so after that paper was published, you started to see other people looking into low dose glyphosate and finding all kinds of problems. And so that's exciting. In fact, in very recent times, just the last couple of years, I'm seeing an increasing number of papers coming out showing low dose glyphosate causing problems. And um, in, in especially some new papers have shown that um, you can expose a pregnant rat to glyphosate at levels that, that the rat, you can't see anything wrong with the rat. And you can't even see anything wrong with the, with the pups when they're born. Mm -hmm. The pups grow up and they have pups. The pups grow up, they have pups. You're down to the grand, grand pups, you know, and the great grand pups. And in those later generations, you see all kinds of problems emerging. It's really, mm -hmm. really fascinating. And it has to do with the exposure of the great, great grandmother to glyphosate at a critical period during pregnancy when the germ cells are being developed in the fetus. And those germ cells get exposed to glyphosate and it causes epigenetic effects that have mm -hmm. lasting effects through multiple generations and they get worse over time. And this is very, very worrisome because I think it's happening to us as well. And one of the reasons why our children are so sick, we have such a, this generation of children, over half of them have various uh, autoimmune diseases, cr chronic illnesses. They're very sick, our children right now compared to what they were when I was a kid. When I was a child, we didn't have anybody who had any, uh, any, uh, allergies to any foods. I never knew about any allergies among any of the kids in my classes in, in grade school. And nobody had autism. There was no ADHD, you know. We didn't know that we were so healthy. Now it's, you know, well, yeah, of course you've got, you know, one in 54 have autism. That's just the way it is. We don't, uh, we're not able to recognize that things are changing very much for the worse. And that if we keep going like this, we're going to be really overwhelmed by the of sickness that we have to cope with all the time. We won't be able to really manage our life in any reasonable way. We're gonna have so much suffering. We really have to stop this poisoning of the environment and not just for the humans, but also when you see what's happening to the bees and the, bum and the butterflies and the frogs. I mean, everything, the, the birds, they're all being wiped out. And I have a section you know, in one of my chapters where I cover all these different uh, species of animals that are being, uh, that have all kinds of diseases that they're suffering from now. Again, it's just much worse than it used to be. And, and uh, the bees have just, you know, because when I used to drive the car at night as a child, you'd end up with a whole bunch of bugs on your windshield, you know? Mm. There were a lot of bugs out flying around at night. Now there aren't. And people need to think about why that is. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, and I guess, you know, where, where that could, could lead us to now um, is, you know, every section of this book, be it about frogs and, you know, how they're affected by glyphosate, or like you said, pollinators or humans and uh, our gut microbiome, um, it, it almost feels, each section of the book feels like a call to action, right? Mm -hmm. to, um, and a way to engage different, different allies to, you know, try to push for the banning of glyphosate um, and also to encourage you know, us as individuals to advocate for herbicide free spaces, not only in our home and community, but also within, you know, our food system. Um, like you talk about how pets are exposed to glyphosate just by walking through people's lawns. Um, and um, I guess, you know, as a reader, and perhaps for those of you listening at home who just heard Stephanie speak about all the different things that this affects and just the, the, um, the magnitude of, of its effects, as well as, as its use, you know, it's used, it's the most widely used herbicide in the entire world with billions of pounds being sprayed every year. Um, yeah, I'm, I, while it is so scary to look at that vast scale, it also feels, 
um, empowering to know that we are, we're able to build power through all of these different avenues and through engaging all these different allies because everyone's affected. You know, everyone's affected. People who care about frogs, people who care about racial justice and workers' rights and, um, you know, our landscapers and our farmers and our farm workers. Um, so I'm wondering if you can also maybe elaborate on the sort of call to action that you have in, in your, the last chapter of your book. Right, and it's both about maintaining your own personal health and of course sharing with your family members. Being active politically, locally, I think is a great thing to do. I think it's bottom up the kind of thing you're doing to go, you know, talk to the um, school and make sure the schoolyard's not putting, using glyphosate in the, in the schoolyard. That's what this Dwayne Johnson, that was his job to apply glyphosate in schoolyards. And it's just outrageous that you would think to do that even, you know, to, with children around. We're really very, uh, not very sensible about these things. Eating certified organic, uh, getting your friends and family to eat certified organic, not only keeps your family healthy, but also promotes the growth of farms that, you know, we need the small family farms. Anybody who's willing to buy a couple acres and set up a farm and grow crops organically, that is like about the best thing you could possibly do right now. I think as a young person starting out, it's a very, uh, it can be a very challenging job and it's a whole, uh, research involved in figuring out how to grow food um, organic uh, organically and inexpensively you know various solutions to um, to controlling weeds that don't involve chemicals it's certainly possible one of the exciting areas i think is robotics with the app application of robotics to uh, controlling weeds and there are people who are developing these robotic tractors that can respond to um, sunlight and to uh, solar paneled solar powered robotic tractors that can uh, that have a uh, uh, vision uh, capabilities because of the um, you know the field of uh, computer vision and they can actually recognize weeds and then they can kill them using say hot water um, there's ways that you can control the weeds that don't involve chemicals and we should be smart enough to figure out how to do that and there are people working on those problems and I really applaud them for that uh, to find a way to grow the crops and still you know not be exorbitantly expensive uh, of course, the government could do a lot if they would just ban the, the chemical would be the most wonderful thing. And anyone who has a stomach to try to fight the government at the federal level, good luck with that. I mean, I encourage you to do it if you can stand it. I found it really, really frustrating. And I, I kind of gave up on the political aspect. I feel that the more powerful approach is to get the consumer educated and get consumers to um, recognize the value of buying certified organic food and then to basically tell their the farmers, we won't buy your food if it's not certified organic and be a forcing function for the farmers to change their ways. I think that's very powerful to, to speak, uh, voting with your dollars by buying certified organic food, both to keep your own family healthy, but also to promote the growth of organic in the farming community. And they will eventually uh, find a way. Biodynamic, you know, re renewable agriculture, there's a whole research area involved with improving the soil. So as you make the soil healthier and healthier, you also increase the yield. You, you decrease the risk of runoff and droughts and things like that. There's so many, you know, all these forest fires that we're facing with all these droughts. Part of that is that the soil is just no longer able to hold the water because it's been so badly eroded because of the danger of the damage to the microbes in the soil that reduces the organic matter, and makes it more easily, uh, makes it easier to lose the, so the topsoil during a storm. So these, all these things will be reversed. If we take good care of the, of the ground, of the land, of the soil, of the crop, um, we get all kinds of benefits from that that are beyond just the cost of growing the food. Because we don't value, we don't uh, recognize the cost of the, of the damage that's being done by glyphosate year by year as part of the cost of growing that food. We don't recognize that. And of course, all the health issues that people have that are so expensive to treat and so painful to experience. Just the idea of not having to suffer from those from those conditions it would be such a great relief that you can get by just growing the food in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to you know expand on um, sort of these two these two big call to actions that you label with farmer advocacy. Um, I think you know maybe a step further than that, or something that might be more accessible, is that. You know, I, I am plugged into the Louisiana, um, the Ag Center, Louisiana Ag Center. And so um, the methods that are taught to farmers and that are the industry standard are 
herbicides, right? Are, mm-hmm. are is the use of herbicides and pesticides. And so oftentimes, well, basically exclusively, farmers, really no matter what they're growing, are incentivized to spray herbicides to grow GMO um, seeds and you know to not or to to grow these these money these cash crops because farming is such a difficult industry so I think you know taking the advocacy to the the teaching institutions to the system right to um, the LSU Ag Center to the Ag Center wherever wherever you might be mm-hmm. whatever body or authoritative body is disseminating um, you know, incentives for farmers, subsidies, sorry, and also education. Um, I think that that is a huge, huge, huge place um, to be to be advocating for. And then additionally, um, just to give context, the town that I live in is um, 44.7% of the people live below the poverty rate. And mm. so when we say vote with our dollar, right, that's, it's impossible. Um, it, it just frankly is impossible. And, you know, where I live, it, it's, it's a food desert. And so it's miles to the nearest grocery store. And that grocery store is Walmart. Um, <laughs> and, you know, as much as I, as I wish I could be zooming in and talking to all of you guys and saying that I get all my food from, a, um, you know, local CSA or from local farmers, organic farmers, there's, there's none. Mm, that's um, rough. And so, you know, not only does that bring urgency to the rest of us to be advocating at a, at a, at a larger scale for folks who don't have the means mm-hmm. in which to protect themselves and their families um, through their purchasing power. Um, but also I, I, the, there are other ways that you can utilize perhaps your money um, or your, your power. Like for example, we, we have a, a healthy buying incentive program. So we, the place that I work at, we run a corner store and this, sorry, this is just a, this is just an example. I'm not trying to plug this, um, but we've received a grant to, um, incentivize people to buy, to buy healthy. So for every um, fruits and vegetable and whole grain and low fat dairy product that they purchase from this corner store, they get a matching dollar. And this, this sort of incentive program is seen nationally. There's a really great one in Michigan. It's called Double Up Food Bucks, which I would encourage you all to check out. Um, but I just, I just wanted to add those to the conversation for those of people who do not have the means in which um, to vote with to vote with their dollar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And another thing I wanted to mention was in agriculture to have cover crops in the, in the winter and to have those cover crops be a variety of different uh, seeds so that they, uh, they actually renew the soil as well as keeping, they just uh, help to uh, pull carbon out of the air. So they're helping with climate change as well, just to grow crop grow crops that you're gonna throw away mm-hmm. in, in, in the off season in order to uh, replenish the soil instead of just nuking it with glyphosate and making sure nothing grows, which is what they do with the chemical-based agriculture. It's a much, much better solution, both uh, for the crops and also for the uh, climate change. Mm-hmm. There have been a couple of questions posted that were relevant to the call to action. So I thought I'd jump in and, and share those as we kind of come into the second half of the webinar. So one was, uh, Gary Iverson says, our utility company sprays our alleyway every year. The overspray comes into our yards and personally our pack of dogs were eating the leaves. Oh, and over no. a few years, they all developed immune system related diseases and cancer. I complained to the state plant board who approves this concoction and they denied any possible overspray. It's been become my mission to free our city by ordinance from the use of glyphosate in our parks and neighborhoods. So my question is, where can I go for help? And it, it raises that you know, the notion that you threw out there kind of Bridget about, can you, how for institute, you know, farming is one thing and it's huge scale and stuff, but starting in the towns where we live and the campuses where we go to school. And yeah. I mean, are there, are there resources, are there tools out there that, that Stephanie, you know about and could share or you, or you too, Bridget, for that matter? I think Bridget probably is closer to this whole space than I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I mean, that, that's a phenomenal question. And I think you'll be comforted to know that you and your, your city wouldn't be the first. Um, I can, or perhaps Mackenzie maybe can drop a link in the chat um, to, there's a whole list of cities um, that have banned glyphosate and, and other herbicides. And actually you can, you can really look into any of those or bring those to your public officials to say, hey, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Look, this has been done. Most notably, um, New York City has recently done that. And um, Oahu, on Oahu, they banned all of um, Roundup from the, the public school systems. And so that was, that was a project with Mackenzie and Dwayne Lee Johnson. Right. I remember that. In fact, I was I, I met him when he came here. Dwayne Johnson came and really talked, convinced them that the local activists were so impressed with what a what great impact he had by showing up in Hawaii. And, they, mm -hmm. and I met him at a dinner that they, they hosted for him. And it was wonderful. He's such a wonderful person, He's such a good advocate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was just amazing that it just worked and that we got glyphosate off the schoolyards in all of Hawaii, actually, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah. And um, one final note is that Beyond Pesticides as well has actual toolkits. So if you look at Beyond Pesticides website, um, you know, they have tools for transforming your own lawn, how to care for your lawn and maintain its aesthetic value without using herbicides, as well as how to get it removed from public parks and lawns and, and different things. And Mackenzie did post a nice link there to uh places that have banned glyphosate as a resource, which could be useful. One other question actually that, that Mackenzie throws out there, which is kind of relevant is, and more maybe for Stephanie and for kind of advocates and activists on this issue, how do you, how do you balance trying to get rid of and focus on the harm of this particular chemical versus the need to transition away from all harmful chemicals? When places blame gly glyphosate, sometimes they start using glufosinate or glufosinate. And how, so how do you broaden the, either broaden the conversation or focus the conversation as necessary when, when there are other, you know, obviously other toxic chemicals at play? Yeah, I, I see also this other uh, question from Gregory Galbraith Hamilton, which is a good one. And I'll get back to that one later because that looks like something I can answer. Yeah, I, I'm very worried that they might just decide to ban glyphosate and just bring out, roll out all these other chemicals that are also herbicides that are probably equally, if not more toxic. Most of them are considered to be more toxic than glyphosate because glyphosate is supposed to be so harmless. And glufosinate is actually a amino acid analog of glutamate. Glyphosate is an amino acid analog of glycine and glufosinate operates, I suspect the same way, but it's just a different amino acid. So we're gonna see all kinds of other strange diseases coming up, I believe, if glufosinate catches on and is used in a major way. It is an herbicide, but it's used a lot less than glyphosate at the moment because glyphosate is so successful at controlling weeds that they, uh, they haven't. But what's happening lately is with the uh, increased um, development of glyphosate resistant weeds, they're having to do glyphosate plus on many of these crops. So they have, glyphosate plus dicamba or glyphosate plus 2,4-D, those are also two very toxic herbicides. And dicamba is causing a, me a mess in the Midwest these days because it, it's, going, it's, it's evaporating and traveling over to the neighbor's farm and killing their crop. They have these group uh, dicamba resistance, and now they've got a double GMO in the crop where it's resistant to both glyphosate and dicamba through this GMO technology. But if your neighbor doesn't have that resistance, they're not protected from the, di from the dicamba that's being applied on the neighbor's farm. There's a lot of lawsuits going on around that topic. It's really a mess just from the crops being destroyed by the dicamba, let alone whatever dicamba might be doing to us. So, and combinations of these chemicals are usually much more toxic than each one's toxicity by itself. They, they augment each other's toxicity in many cases. So I think with this, uh, these combos are going to cause you know, additional problems um, with various diseases that I can't even guess what they're going to be. And you mentioned <laughs> that uh, the comment from Gregory or the question yes, from Gregory, I'd love which, to... which I'll just share with everyone because yeah, not everyone can it? see it. But it, I, he says, I live in a major port. Port has grain elevators, mostly for international shipping of wheat. I'm concerned that glyphosate residues are being emitted into the air, kind of mimics ethanol production appearing in combustion engine exhaust. 
are you aware of any air quality studies targeted at glyphosate evaluation? And MJ Hamilton also asked about air quality, the issue of air quality and glyphosate. Right, excellent question. And I've been saying now ever since COVID-19 appeared, I, I picked up on the possibility that glyphosate is a contributing, I believe glyphosate is a major contributor to uh, the epidemic that we're seeing really bad outcomes from COVID. When you look across the world, you see that the countries you, that use a lot of glyphosate are having a lot more trouble controlling COVID-19 than the countries that are mostly organic. And I, I think that's not an accident. I think the glyphosate is getting into the lungs. And I think one of the major players could be the development of biofuels. And I've, I've been reading a lot about that and it really kind of makes sense to me where we see those initial cities that had those major problems that alerted us to this pandemic. Um, the the um, Wuhan originally and then in Lombardy region of uh, Italy and then New York City, if you remember, they was, the epidemic was kind of coming at us from those three places and all three of them have very poor air quality and all three of them are used biofuels and are leaders in the biofuel uh, development. And the biofuels are derived, for example, from crops that are sprayed with glyphosate right before harvest. You take a wheat crop, you grow the wheat, you spray it with, with glyphosate, you harvest the seed, and then you take the rubble that's left behind, throw it on a barge, take it down to the city, run it through a bioprocessing plant, and out comes biodiesel, bioethanol, biogas, all these different biofuels, I suspect contaminated with glyphosate. And now you have, you know, you've, they've designed uh, trucks that run uh, almost um, almost on pure bioethanol, which is going to be, I think, um, releasing glyphosate into the air. If the glyphosate reaches combustion, it'll break down, but it can evaporate before it reaches con combustion, I suspect, and it's getting into the air. And in fact, a study in Brazil just came out a couple of months ago where they looked at, they looked for glyphosate in nanoparticles in the air, and they looked in the agricultural regions where the glyphosate was being used, and they looked in the nearby city and they found glyphosate in both cases and they found higher levels in the city than in the places where the glyphosate was being used. And I suspect that's because Brazil is a leader in bioethanol. They have these trucks that run on almost pure bioethanol derived from sugarcane that's sprayed with glyphosate right before harvest. <clears throat> so I think, you know, for sure, air quality is an issue. Um, and even in the city, which is really, you think in the city, you shouldn't have to worry about glyphosate in your air, but this could be a way by which it's happening. And I will also say the airplanes is also possibilities. But there's a bioaviation biofuel, aviation biofuel that's being used in the airplanes. They're getting credit for it, in fact, because they're, you know, the airplanes are very costly in terms of carbon emissions and they're getting credit for biofuel. So they're very big on the aviation biofuel concept. And uh, I think that that's causing toxic air in the airplane. Wow. Um, one other question that uh, this is raised by Emily Marquez. She says, I agree that glyphosate use isn't, isn't good for health or the environment, but I wanted to ask about Dr. Seneff's hypothesis on glycine getting substituted for glyphosate in amino acids. Mm -hmm. In her paper, the citations she uses to support this idea are all written by her and co-authors this looks like a very doable experiment from my perspective as a biologist. Is there evidence other than your papers, Stephanie, that support this or have you tried testing the hypothesis in the laboratory? I would love to do that. I don't have a laboratory, so it's not something I'm able to do, but I've been trying to get people to, uh, to do it, people who have the capabilities. And in fact, there was a paper that was published, which has the title that says basically glyphosate does not substitute for glycine. They claim to have proved it. I wrote a lot about that paper in my book and I critiqued it because that paper is extremely interesting. They used these uh, breast cancer cells that had been grown, they had been maintained in culture for decades from somebody who had breast cancer way back in like the 1970s or something. And these cultures were probably maintained on glyphosate contaminated nutrients the entire time. So they were able to accumulate, I suspect, a lot of glyphosate residues in the proteins in the, that were produced by these cancer cells. Then they took these cancer cells and had two, uh, they had the control group and the treatment group and the, the control group was exposed to glyphosate. But if you don't do the experiment right, that glyphosate may not be taken up by the cells. Glyphosate, it depends on what else is going on in the environment, whether it gets taken up or not. So they found, they actually had a beautiful method for detecting the, uh, a heavy protein. They could actually detect a protein that was too heavy because it had that extra piece stuck on the glyphosate's nitrogen atom. So they had a, they had a beautiful method, which I would encourage other people to, to, who know how to do this sort of thing to run similar experiments because they found 
Uh, so they listed, so they had a beautiful figure with uh, nine different panels and they gave the actual amino acid sequence that was found, that was found to be too heavy, uh, exactly as you would expect if that glycine was a glyphosate, in particular glycines in particular sequences. And it turns out that you can look up all those proteins uh, on the web to find out what they are. They're all various human proteins um, that are connected to binding to phosphate in many cases. So I basically found that the proteins that they found contaminated with glyphosate were proteins that make sense in terms of my arguments for what kind of a protein would be susceptible to glyphosate contamination. It made sense. And so they identified beautifully a set of proteins that I would expect, you know, I could have predicted that they would have. And then the, their, the reason why they claim it, what well, didn't happen was because they said that the treated group and the untreated group had similar results. So they didn't see a difference between the treated and the untreated, but they did find glyphosate in the, in the amino acid, in the proteins, which, you know, they just said, oh, it was all, it was all just errors. All of it was errors. And they had something else they were looking for and they didn't find any for the other thing they were anticipating there might've been a different kind of um, modification could have shown up as a consequence of the glyphosate, uh, which didn't happen at all. But with respect to the glyphosate, they found all these lovely examples of it happening. It's just because they found it in both sets that they said it was, it was not true. So I would, I would disagree with them on their conclusion. And I would love for someone else to do an experiment like that, you know, more, more carefully to see if they also can find. And I would love to see which proteins they're finding. I, that's very interesting to me. Which proteins are they finding and where are they finding these glycines being substituted? One other question. I'm trying to scoop up the last few questions as we're kind of coming to the end of our hour here. But uh, Meredith referenced you, that you said that Glyphosate is linked to Alzheimer's disease in dolphins that you referenced that she's asking, well, is there a specific species or anything more? You could these, say well, and so they didn't link it to glyphosate. They just said that the dolphins were getting Alzheimer's in the, in the Florida waterways. Uh, and Alzheimer's in humans is going up exactly in the step of the rise in glyphosate usage on core crops. And I wrote about that in my book. Uh, there's a, a protein called amyloid beta which is well known to be the sort of misfolded version of amyloid beta causing these fibrils that are linked to Alzheimer's disease. And that protein has a particular sequence in it. There's a GXXGXXXG sequence that has glycines that are critical for it to form an alpha helix structure. And when those glycines get messed, get substituted by other amino acids, it, the helix no longer forms. It forms these beta sheets that become soluble and then form these fibrils, characteristic misfolding characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. So I think the glyphosate is substituting for one or more of those glycines, disrupting the protein's ability to naturally form the way it should and go into the membrane and then causing the Alzheimer's disease. So I think it's causing it in the dolphins the same way. But this paper, the, the article that talked about the dolphins having Alzheimer's did not mention glyphosate. Got it. Okay. Um, Alyssa is asking if you could share the citation info or DOI for that paper. And I'm assuming she, you're, she's referencing the paper we are talking about just a second ago. The one that's the, the glycine does not substitute for gly glyphosate. I have it. Yeah. I don't know if I can find okay. it. And that's, that's fine. If you, I mean, it. thank you. Yeah, I can send it to someone if there's an email or something. Uh, or Alyssa, send it. You, or yeah, we could. If you guys uh, can remind me, I send it to you and you can, I don't know. How do we get it to the person who wants oh, it? I, it looks like Emily Marquez. Already um, posted it. Oh, good. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <Somebody> <laughs> Thank, you it. Thank you for being helpful. A couple other questions. Uh, one, have there been any prospective studies of foods contaminated with glyphosate, corn, soy, wheat, for example, and changes in the gut? microbiome. I understand that the cytal agent can preferentially link to bifido, bifido, but I bifidobacteria, but I wonder about an actual clinical change that might be assessed. In a study involving humans, um, gut microbiome or? Yeah. Not... Studies of foods contaminated with glyphosate linked to changes in the, in the microbiome. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I'm aware of any specifically quite like that. There certainly are studies that have shown that the microbiome is differentially affected by glyphosate in animal studies. For example, chicken uh, gut microbiota, they've shown that um, salmonella and clostridia are, are hardy. They're re resistant against glyphosate, whereas bifidobacteria and, and lactobacillus are quite sensitive, particularly bifidobacteria, very sensitive to glyphosate. So those are, those are two really important um, 
dominant species in the gut naturally, the bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus, and they are known to be much more sensitive to glyphosate than these other species that are causing disease, clostridia in particular. Uh, excess clostridia is linked to autism in multiple studies. And they release metabolites that can get into the brain and cause damage. Um, and at least one more question. As a, someone asked, as a mom, what would you say is the most important thing I could do to protect my children against glyphosate? Is it organic food or the parks and schoolyards that they uh, play in? I mean, if so, that's a good question, and I don't have to bring a good it home. Yeah. I would really be horrified to think, you know, my grandchildren, my, 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 my daughter in law shared with me that they, they told them they had to stay. Uh, stay away from the schoolyard for two hours because they had sprayed glyphosate in the morning, two hours, you know, that was amazing to me. They thought after two hours, it should be fine. So th there's a lack of awareness, but definitely the playgrounds are very worrisome, you know, because they really get kind of close to the ground with the playgrounds and they could really get a pretty serious exposure. And I certainly have been contacted by people who were accidentally sprayed, like someone just walking their dog and they were spraying and they got hit by the spray. And it, and both the dog and the, and the person who was walking the dog got very sick and it, they never recovered. I mean, they never got better. You know, they were sick after that, just from that one exposure. So you have to be really, really careful. Great. Um, I think that's it. We are kind of at the end of our hour. Anything, Bridget, that you wanted to wrap up with or? I'm just very grateful to have gotten to participate in this conversation. Um, and I know that I see Mackenzie just linked um, a few ways to stay in touch after this conversation ends. Um, and so I definitely encourage you all to, to do that. Um, we, can, we can link our emails, or I mean, sorry, I can link my email, Stephanie, I don't wanna speak for you. Um, if any, if anyone's interested in pursuing this or learning more about Herbicide Free Campus. Um, yeah, and you can find me on stephaniesenef.net. And my email is, uh, is senef at csale.mit.edu. And thanks again, Stephanie, for the great book. Thank you. Thank you for, for doing this. It was great. Right. Take care, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks Bye. For being here.